Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to be here at State of the Net. It is, though, a, a little funny for me um, when I think about being here speaking in, in front of this group um, that are here for this State of the Net conference. Um, I am a, a grandmother who likes Jane Austen novels and just got a Twitter account last week. <laughs> so um, we'll see what I could do to, uh, to give you uh, 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 some information about DHS and where we are with the State of the Net that hopefully will be uh, um, useful to those of you here in the room today. Um, but at this, uh, as everyone points out, everyone is an internet state stakeholder, even if they don't know it yet. I'm learning it more and more each day. And that's what brings me here today, how the internet has increasingly connecting us with our threats in Homeland Security. Specifically, terrorists are using the internet to recruit and radicalize and share information for do-it-yourself mass murder. Nearly every terrorist plot we uncover today has a digital dimension. To give you a sense of the scale of that problem, the FBI has said that there are currently 1,000 homegrown terrorist investigations across the 50 states and 1,000 ISIS-related investigations. Some of these overlap, but still, the scale is alarming. And those are just the suspects we know about. It's like living among potential landmines. In both the recent terrorist attack in New York, the attempted Port Authority bus station bomber, and the Halloween attack with the rental truck, the, attacker, the attackers were appearing to be inspired in part by online terrorist propaganda. It is becoming a very, very common tale. An attack happens, we review the suspects' electronics and social media, and we find radical learnings, jihadist connections, beheading videos, and more. To be very clear, the internet itself is not the problem. Terrorists use social media for the same reason anyone uses social media. It's an easy way to get connected. The technology that's helping businesses thrive and families stay in touch is the same technology that's helping terrorists conspire at broadband speeds. You can think of it like fire. Fire can cook your dinner or warm your house, but it can also engulf communities and leave long, lifelong scars like it just recently did in California. It's important to note also that the internet itself does not cause radicalization, though it does appear to serve as a catalyst. Internet and mobile communications technology just make the radicalization process faster and easier and can accelerate the path to violence. While ISIS isn't the first or only terrorist group to have a presence online, their groundbreaking use of open social media platforms has forced all of us to confront the challenging issues with clear eyes. There are a lot of thorny issues with combining violent, combating violent radicalism, radicalization excuse me, online. Issues surrounding the terms of service, content removal versus monitoring, the role of private companies in confronting this national security problem, and the role of the government in challenging terrorist narratives. These issues are further complicated as terrorists move from open channels to encrypted or closed ones. Before we think about what we can do to combat terrorist use of the internet, we have to acknowledge three facts. The first is the legal framework of the United States and the Constitution that we in the federal government have sworn to protect and defend. In the United St States, ideology, regardless of the cause it supports, is protected by the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech of, or of that of the press. In practice, that means that merely advocating political or social positions, strong rhetoric, or the philosophic embrace of violent tactics may be protected by the Constitution. Just looking at ISIS propaganda or visiting a neo-Nazi website does not constitute illegal activity in our country. Of course, while the government may not be able to take action against specific content, this does not preclude social media companies from taking action. The second fact is that current removal is a short-term and difficult um, system to automate. 
when your target proliferates at high volumes and at constantly changing media and speed. Around the world, internet users upload more than 400 hours of content every minute. That's a lot to sift through for our companies. Additionally, two-thirds of the terrorist content is reshared within the first two hours of its life cycle. The good news here is that the government and technologies are developing tools that automatically detect and flag terrorist content, and there are indications that te technical solutions will be among the most effective ways to manage the volume. However, as extremist groups migrate to encrypted messaging platforms, monitoring becomes more difficult. So while the content removal is an important part of the response, it cannot be the entire response. The third fact is that any long-term response must acknowledge that there are various audiences at play and each have different information needs. Some individuals are already mobilized to violence. Some are radicalized but have not yet taken steps towards violence. Other people want to actively refute terrorist propaganda. And then there's the majority of people who just want to go about their daily lives without the threat of terrorism. There is no one answer. There is no one silver bullet. But we at the Department of Homeland Security are surgically focused on the terrorism prevention, trying to prevent and intervene in the process of radicalization. And because so much of the radicalization is tied to the internet, and because the internet knows no borders, we are actively trying to prevent both international and domestic terrorists from radicalizing and recruiting PR people to violence. Through social media, social science research, and the whole body of knowledge, we know that it's not a linear process. There are a number of root causes and drivers. Domestically, we've approached terrorism pre prevention in a range of ways. Today, I'm here to tell you a little bit about how we are trying to challenge terrorist narratives, share information, and catalyze non-government solutions. First, challenging narratives. The response entails either challenging narratives directly or providing alternative options. Through the internationally recognized private-public partnership known as Peer-to-Peer -peer Countering Violent Countering Extremism Program, we've engaged with long, young people internationally. Peer-to-peer -peer challenge teams of students from colleges and universities to develop and implement social media programs targeting the narratives and online recruiters of violent extremism. We recognize the need for more resources in this space, so in July, the Department of Homeland Security Office of Terrorism Prevention Partnerships awarded two grants, 26 grants to community-based organizations. At least half a dozen of the awardees will have a robust online presence, including pushing back against the messages of ISIS and other terrorist recruiters and radicalizers. For example, one project is developing an application that will put high quality video editing tools, tips on digital marketing, and pithy relevant research findings on radicalization and recruitment in the hands of thousands. This will help make the creation of counter messages a viral practice and will add to the peer-to-peer -peer work that I mentioned earlier. While we are limited in what we can do domestically in the counter narrative space, countering narratives is an important part of our ter terrorism prevention strategy. I am excited to see the grant awardees move their ideas from application into action and then monitoring the results. Our second broad category of terrorism prevention is information sharing, and DHS has done a lot of work in this space over the last year. We want to expand understanding of violent radicalism and terrorist recruitment so more people can identify it, and more importantly, more people can prevent it. This includes tools such as developing social media community awareness briefings to help technology sector become aware of terrorist recruitment online so they can catalyze efforts to counter it. It also includes conferences such as the Dig Digital Forum on Terrorism Prevention that DHS co-sponsored last September. 
at the digital forum, experts from government, the tech industry, maybe many of you, startups and community organizations gather together to share information and showcase technologies and techniques to counter the use of terrorist social media. Across the U.S. government, DHS also administratively houses an interagency task force to increase information sharing on terrorism prevention and with other agencies, including the National Counterterrorism Center, the FBI, and Department of Justice. That wide range of stakeholders brings me to our third category of prevention, catalyzing non-government solutions. With apologies to the state of the net, I want to paraphrase your motto. Everyone is a terrorism prevention stakeholder, even if they don't know it yet. We believe that in combining the talents of communities, NGOs, and the technology sector, we can drive non-governmental responses to terrorist recruitment and radicalization that are authentic, more scalable, and more sustainable. We can create and disseminate more powerful counter-narratives and alternative narratives. The truth is, the government doesn't have great credibility in the online space, for good reasons, I believe. We are too old, too big, and too square. We need credible voices, especially from our community partners. So it's important that we help empower those groups with the information, partnerships, and resources they need to be successful. This is not a fight DHS or the U.S. government can win on its own. Our enemies are dispersed, and they are crowdsourcing their activity. Fortunately, our allies are fighting with us in the same space. In the past year, there has been tremendous progress in terrorism prevention, particularly in the Technology Center. Last July, the United Kingdom Home Secretary Amber Rudd and I traveled to Silicon Valley to meet with the newly launched Global Internet Forum on Counterterrorism, or GIFCT. The GIFCT, led by Facebook, Microsoft, YouTube, and Twitter, is the first time major companies have come together to work on research and technology techniques in this area. Moreover, they are committed to helping smaller companies that may not have the same resources tackle terrorism prevention online. I am very, very encouraged by the work of GIFCT to counter this incredibly dangerous problem. We hope more companies will consider engaging with us to help stop terrorism here and abroad because terrorist radicalization makes the world a more dangerous place for each one of us. We also know that other countries share our concerns. At the 72nd United Nations General Assembly this year, UK Prime Minister, Italian Prime Minister, and the French President addressed world leaders on this topic, along with our Acting Deputy Secretary at the time, Ms. Claire Grady. And in October, I joined my international counterparts at a G7 meeting in Ischia, Italy, to discuss how to prevent terrorist use of the internet with the participation of the private center, private sector. And interesting enough, the private sector attended with us. So this was a true government-private industry collaboration on countering terrorism on the internet. Our new Secretary Nielsen is continuing this robust engagement, and soon she will be traveling to Silicon ba Valley for our second meeting with GIFCT, along with UK Home Secretary Amber Rudd. We will also co-host the second Digital Forum on Terrorism Prevention, also in Silicon Valley in February. Some of the topics on the agenda will be innovations in counter-messaging, content take down, and online to offline interventions. The third item is important because it's not enough to push back against terrorist messaging. We have to ensure organizations are trying to develop off-ramps for people at risk for radicalization to mobilization to violence. These off-ramps need to be developed in partnership with local organizations, mirroring methods proven in related fields like domestic violence and suicide prevention. As I've said before, we, the government, cannot do this alone. I'm very proud of the role DHS has played in terrorism prevention so far and countering terrorist use of the internet, but our work and your work is not yet done. Preventing terrorism will remain core to the mission of the department, but we are very interested in working with partners such as you from all corners of the world to make it a safer place for each one of us. 
Help us, please work with us. I know there are members of my staff from the Office of Terrorism Prevention Partnerships here today. Uh, they're raising their hand here and they're anxious to hear from you throughout the conference and let us know. Michael Brown, um, who raised his hand, and Clara Sow from the CBE Task Force. I don't mean to frighten you, but please believe me when I tell you this is urgent. Each morning we sit through our intelligence briefings and I am here today with an urgency and a purpose. Right now, in some dark corner of the internet, there are step-by-step -step instructions on how to build a bomb with items you could pick up in any hardware store. Right now, a terrorist recruiter with hate in his heart is feeding lies to a confused teenager he found earlier. Right now, someone in the country is being tested. Do they become a soldier for the caliphate or do they turn away? But working together, we can change the outcome and we can change lives. We are all terrorist prevention stakeholders, even if we don't know it yet. Thank you.